And Pamela you touched on it. In these settings, debunking surgery can also be one option. Um, again, this is not with curative intent, but just to help with those symptoms. And you brought up somatostatin analog, uh, analogs. Can we take a little deeper dive here? Because we have octreotide, linreotide, different doses, how frequently we can give this. And do you give test those? When we're using somatostatin analogs, something that we worry about ends up being these agents can actually mimic the underlying disease. Can you touch on this, how you tailor when it comes to somatostatin analogs? Yes, definitely. So, um, so somatostatin analogs do kind of mimic naturally occurring somatostatin. So the history is that that is a very um, short acting hormone. So it was not a practical treatment to give in its natural <laughs> form. And so long, so Somatostatin analogs, there are, there are a number, but the ones that are FDA approved for NETS include short acting octreotide, that's for control of carcinoid syndrome specifically, um, long acting octreotide, which is a monthly intramuscular injection um, that is approved both for hormone control. Well, actually, it's formally FDA approved for hormone control. Um, I'll get to the FDA approval for um, sort of tumor control. There's lanreotide that's approved for both hormone control and tumor control. Um, Long-acting lanreotide and octreotide, they are essentially the same drug. They have the same mechanism of action in terms of affinity for somatostatin receptor type 2, um, and they are used very interchangeably. The difference is in how they're administered. So octreotide long-acting is intramuscular, lanreotide long-acting is deep subcutaneous. Um, there are some conflicting data on patient reported outcomes in terms of how they feel as they're being administered. Um, most patients have told me there's not a significant difference. There's some studies that suggest that the deep um, sub-Q may be less painful for patients, but really they, um, they are felt to have the same mechanism of action. They're used very similarly. Your question about testos. So I would say there used to be a um, sort of a, a philosophy that you needed to give a short acting octreotide testos prior to giving long acting. I think that's now fallen out of favor. These are very safe medications. Um, for patients that need somatostan analogs for relief of carcinoid syndrome, flushing diarrhea, I may start with a short acting, but purely because I want quick relief. Um, I will start that simultaneous with a long acting dose. And then once that long acting kicks in, they may not need the short acting as much. For initiation of SSAs for tumor control, you do not need it to even use short acting octreotide. You would just start from the get go with either octreotide or lanreotide. Okay, for localized disease, we've established we rely on local therapy, that is surgery, even sometimes radiation or ablation. For metastatic disease, if it is somatostatin receptor positive and rather functional, we could utilize them for hormone control or rather, uh, sorry, tumor control or symptoms control. Any scenario where you would utilize somatostatin analogs for non-functional NETs at all? Yeah, absolutely. I often will use somatostatin analogs as a first-line tumor control agent for patients with with well-differentiated nets, um, especially grade one and two, and especially if they are fairly low volume disease. That's often mm -hmm. our first go-to, again, because it is so well tolerated. I tell patients in clinic, I don't want the fix to be worse than the problem. Like if you're asymptomatic, I don't want to make you feel sick. Yeah. Indeed. And with regards to utilizing gallium dotatate scans, how often do you get it? Because do you get it at the time of progression and every three to four months or even six months, do you rely on CTCAP in those settings? And also, do you have a washout period from the somatostatin analog before considering gallium dotatate? All good questions. So um, I still rely on standard cross-sectional imaging, whether it's CT, and, and a key takeaway is that it has to be ordered as a multi-phasic CT. That arterial phase imaging is really important for the well diff nets. So either contrast CT or an MRI. For patients with metastatic disease, typically every three to four months, I will get a gallium dota PET scan every like at, at time of diagnosis um, at time of progression especially if i'm considering um, lutetium dotatate as a treatment and i will use it to answer a specific question that may arise on a ct or mri 
for example, let's say a patient has had um, sort of cytoreductive surgery. They've been um, sort of, they are radiographically free of disease, but let's say something pops up in six months or in a year, that DOTA PET can actually be very helpful in distinguishing between inflammation or true recurrence and, and can help clarify a lot. 